Howdy, everybody. So glad you all could join us this evening. I'm your host, Lena Sutherland. I'm owner and author at Homeschooling Without Training Wheels and homeschool mother of eight kiddos, ages teen to toddler. And I am thrilled this evening to be joined by not one but two guests, both ladies who've had the privilege um, or whom I have had the privilege of hosting here on Live Without Training Wheels before. So I will let you tell, let them tell you a little bit more about themselves in a moment. But we have um, Amy Sloan from Humility and Doxology and Mary Wilson from Not Before Seven, both fellow extrovert moms. And this is something that we've talked about um, behind the scenes before. And we thought how fun it would be to have a conversation live with you guys about homeschooling, and being extroverts, because there's certainly plenty out there, and I'm glad that there's plenty out there about the particular struggles and challenges and strategies for homeschooling as an introvert, and definitely have dear friends who are introverts. But tonight, we're going to be talking about homeschooling as an extrovert. And if you are an introvert and you're here with us, you are more than welcome to join in with us. Um, you know, all, all are welcome. Um, <laughs> Mary said she just had some internet issues. She's coming back. I'm back. <laughs> Got it. Okay. All right. Hold on just a minute. Okay. So um, let me tell you just a few things, some housekeeping details to help you get settled here. If you are watching this broadcast from Facebook, you're more than welcome to just keep watching on Facebook. We're not monitoring comments on the Facebook post right now, but we can certainly come over there after the video is over and um, interact if you've got questions or comments there. What we're doing is that we're live broadcasting from a platform called Crowdcast. And there is a link in the video description. If you're watching from YouTube or Facebook, you can find that link. You can hop over and join us inside the Crowdcast platform. That's where we're seeing the comments as they come in. And we'll be doing a little Q&A at the end from the Ask a Question box there. If you are with us in Crowdcast, let me tell you a little bit about how to make use of that. So at the bottom of the screen, underneath our faces, there's a button that says Polls. If you click on that, you can answer the poll and let us know whether you would describe yourself as an extrovert or an introvert or an ambivert, a little bit of both. Um, and these polls are anonymous. It's just kind of for fun. And then right next to the polls is a button that says, ask a question. So if you have a question during the course of the video at any time, you're welcome to pop it in there. And one of the fun things about the ask a question feature in Crowdcast is that you can upvote questions that are of most interest to you. Sometimes we answer all the questions that we have. Sometimes we run out of time, just depends on the topic and the audience. So if you see a question that's of particular interest to you, you're going to want to upvote it because we'll just start at the top with the questions that look like they would be the help, most helpful to the most people. And if you're watching this on the replay, another fun feature about the ask a question box is that you can click on a button next to each question and jump right to the place in the video where we talk about that question if you uh, want to hop right to something. Or um, sometimes we have folks who come on before a video and ask a question and then aren't able to attend live. And then they can come back later and jump right to the place in the video where we've asked or re uh, responded to that question that they asked. So, all right. So before we hop into talking about being a homeschool mom extrovert, um, let's just take a moment to get to know each of our guests. Amy, would you just tell us a little bit about you and your kiddos? Sure. So I'm Amy Sloan. I've been married for 14 and a half years and have five kids from three to 13. And we've been homeschooling them from the beginning in a restfully classical eclectic kind of approach. And I'm right at Humility and Doxology and love coffee and book lists that are way too long. <laughs> and Mary, how about you? I'm reminded why we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Mary and I have been married for 20 years this summer. We have four kids. They range from 16 to nine. I had to think about that a minute. Um, I blog at Not Before Seven, um, and oh, and I'm also on staff with Brave Writer. And I would say my homeschool is very Brave Writer lifestyle. If you're familiar with that, kind of a Charlotte Mason eclectic um, kind of homeschool education. Mm -hmm. Mailman was delivering some some happy mail today to many mamas across homeschooldom. Um, 
So, okay, so what we're gonna do is this is gonna be very chatty, informal. So if you are watching with us and you've got comments and you wanna share your experience, I know it's not exactly the same as being on the screen where you can just talk, but we would love for you guys to just chime in and you know tell us what you do or what you found challenging or what you have found helpful because we would love for you guys to feel like you're a part of the conversation too. So. One of the fun things uh, that Amy wrote recently was a post about three myths about the extroverted mom. And it really got me thinking, there are some things I think that, um, you know, we assume about being an introvert or being an extrovert. Um, and I thought that was a great place to start. So let's start with yours, Amy. Just tell us a little bit about what are some myths that people assume are true of extroverted moms? Well, a lot of times, again, in like stereotype kind of meme culture, um, and mm -hmm. I love I love funny memes, and um, so I enjoy laughing at them. But I, it seems to put a dichotomy between an extrovert who's always confident and never is shy or socially awkward, um, an extrovert who never wants to be alone, can't get enough of people, and maybe is a little flighty and doesn't like to think deeply versus an introvert who thinks deeply about things and doesn't want to be around people and um, maybe is more reserved. So I kind of address some of those things. I've had some interesting conversations with actually some in real life friends who are extroverts who can sometimes feel shy or socially awkward and how hard that can be like, as an extrovert. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that I've noticed, and I don't know if this is I don't know. I'm not like, um, you know, an expert on the whole Myers-Briggs thing. So maybe there's somebody out there who's going to say like, oh, this is technically <laughs> incorrect or something. But <laughs> I feel like um, I feel like my extroverted tendencies ebb and flow with various times of the month. Like, mm -hmm. you know, there are times where I feel more like outgoing and I want to be where the people are and I would be really disappointed if I missed a thing. And then there are other times where like, I don't want to talk to people. I don't want there to be any people, even grown up ladies. I don't want to, you know, I want to talk to the people. Yeah. I agree. How about you, Mary? Are there any, any things you've run into where you thought, yeah, that's not exactly yeah, what know, it's like to be an extrovert. Yeah. I mean, just what you were just saying as if extroverts never want some time alone, though I will say, I think that changes with age and with, um, time in life and just things going on probably mm -hmm. in my 20s before children I probably never craved time alone like ever mm -hmm. like I mm -hmm. could have been with people 24 hours a day and completely content to do so and maybe that's what people picture just is always true but now as a mom of four and um, I was telling the girls before this started that for extroverted kids um, I find I crave more time alone, but that doesn't make me not an extrovert anymore. Right. My energy source still comes from conversation and interactions and, and all of that, but I do really enjoy just a quiet evening at home sometimes, which kind of was yes. a new experience for me. Yes, yes. Okay, so Amy has this quote that she mentioned, I think we were in, in a, like the same Facebook thread one time months and months ago. And so Amy, what was your comment about like the, the strange irony of being an extroverted homeschool mom. Yeah, so especially as an extrovert homeschool mom, like Mary was saying, we're with these wonderful children who we love very much, we're with them all the time. So the extrovert homeschool mom can be in this awkward position of being simultaneously very lonely and also peopled out. And that can be a very difficult path to navigate. Right, right, because you get to the end of the evening and you would dearly love adult conversation, but you would also dearly love to not talk anymore at all That's or hear anyone talk to you, <laughs> right? So you're like, during the day, you're thinking like, I really need more people time. And then at the, in the end of the day, you're like, but not today. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Okay, so we've got some great comments over here. Jenny says um, that she loves to talk, but she hates small talk. So, you know, the idea that like extroverts would just talk about random things and wouldn't really need, you know, deeper conversations might, be a misunderstanding. Um, and Amy said, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm pop in on that one just to say, and I don't want to introduce another personality test, but you know, <laughs> I, I love the Enneagram now. Yeah. But what's been interesting for me, and, and I won't even try to go into the whole Enneagram, but it, um, the Myers-Briggs is more of your external actions 
and the mm -hmm. Enneagram is more of your internal motivation. And it's been really interesting. I think it helps explain the differences in introverts, like someone who is um, a really emotional, heart, deep feeling person can still be an extrovert. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they're just very in touch with their feelings. They're not gonna like small talk. You know, mm -hmm. they're gonna really have those deep, meaningful conversations where somebody else that's another number on the Enneagram um, might be more about just small talk all the time and that's really fulfilling to them. It's not a, a big deal. So I think that's yeah, really yeah. interesting to recognize that you can't paint all extroverts with this broad stroke. Absolutely. Although, and, okay, so later, I think I'm correct that we are all three extroverted moms and all three married to quite introverted men. Is this true? Yes, this is yeah. true. Okay, so for my husband, so he despises small talk. Um, as a matter of fact, he's been known to say that if you, sit in church and you hear a really good sermon, the best way to meditate on that sermon is to leave as soon as possible after church <laughs> is over. Because, you know, if you get involved in the conversation, it will be like, you know, like, how's the weather? What did you watch on TV this week? You know, and so, <laughs> so for him, you know, his, his, um, so I, you know, I prefer a deeper conversation too, but I feel like for him, it's like the risk is higher. Because if I go and I have some conversation and it's small talk and that's not what I'd prefer. I'd prefer deeper conversation, but I'm not like, oh no, I just used up my three ounces of peopleness on small talk. For him, it was like, that's all I had to give. And now it's done. And that was <laughs> completely not satisfying, right? So he, for him, it's like the risk is greater. Um, you know, it's not that like, oh, I, I just love superficial chit chat and he doesn't. It's more like, you know, like if he's going to people, it better really be worth it. <laughs> He has to ration yeah. his energy. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, Jenny says she married an introvert too. Um, so, and Amy says that when she was younger, she wanted to people all the time and now she needs quite alone time to recharge. Um, and I think that's partly a, just a facet of being um, sensory overloaded. Like, you know, you're getting input all day long um, and it's not necessarily the kind that's like filling up your people time tank. Um, Let's see, Amy says her husband hates small talk as well. He's okay to be around people, but would be better without it. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's very interesting. I wonder what it is about, um, you know, if there's some reason why these extroverted mamas are marrying introverted men. Um, maybe it's a good balancing uh, factor there. Okay, so what do you feel like are some of the challenges then of being, being uh, homeschool moms who are extroverts? Mary, what do you find particularly difficult about that? <laughs> I just saw somebody. <laughs> Sorry, that was a funny comment. Introverts yeah. are the extrovert, so we can talk on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> that actually, ouch, yeah. Purely Maybe. selfish. That, that brings you through a little. Yeah. <laughs> um, that was funny. Um, yeah, I think in particular, it is finding that. I actually found that this, it's gonna sound ironic. When my kids were all really little, I actually found that I could have adult conversation more easily because we were meeting at playgrounds, parks, and all these play dates. We were pushing babies in strollers and just chatting all day long. I really loved that. And a few years ago, I realized I really miss that. Like, mm -hmm. I don't meet a group of moms with the babies anymore, and moms can just all chat while little ones are playing blocks. Like right. now we just don't do that because my kids span from six to nine or 16 to nine. So there's no more real playground dates. As I'm saying that I have one tomorrow. I haven't had one in like <laughs> two or three years, but finally, cause now my oldest drives so she can go do yeah. her own things. And I can now take the two younger ones and go on playground dates. <laughs> but I find that's been much harder. And when we get together, you know, our kids are older and they're often involved in the activity we're doing, which is great. Um, but it is, I have to be more purposeful to find the adult only time. Right. Or like, you That's know, you're part. sitting there with a three-year-old on your lap and you can talk about, you know, more personal, private things. Not a big deal. The three-year-old has no clue what you're talking about. Um, but, you know, when it's your nine-year-old sitting there by you, then it's like, okay, Ooh. so we're probably not going to get into, you know, whatever, you know, kinds of things or like I, you know, since I have a span, I always feel like I'm checking like which little bodies are close by and are these ones I can say something in front of <laughs> yes. or not. Totally relate to so. that. Yeah. Especially so we have the big age range as well from, you know, preschool to teenager. 
and it makes it harder like with the play dates I have these little kids who when their older siblings were little we were always going and doing activities and hanging out with people and now we just don't have that same flexibility but mm -hmm. then if we're with families that have older children I'm still like chasing the three-year-old and making sure he doesn't <laughs> die so it makes it a lot harder just even in like ordinary like a church or a homeschool group like just ordinary gathering a social gathering it's just more challenging for sure mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so what about mary with with children who are also extroverts do you feel like that has an impact on your schedule and how your time is is divided up yeah i was actually going to pipe in and say um part of them me trying to get my cup filled is i'm until this year when one got their license, <laughs> I spent a lot of time running them around because they need their social time. So planning activities, planning events, running to sports or art, or um, my oldest even just, you know, around 15 wanted to meet friends for coffee and hang out and chat. And that was great, except I was the chauffeur for everything. Now, sometimes mm -hmm. it started working out where the moms would meet for coffee and the daughters, but you know, I have three other children. So mm -hmm. that doesn't always work out. Sometimes it was great and I could, but other times, you know, I had to drop her off. So yeah, it gets really sticky in there for a few years because I'm trying to do my best by them to make sure, like my priority, I'm not saying I neglect myself, but it was making sure their cups are full, especially as homeschoolers. I feel like they don't get that interaction all day long with people, which I actually have children who would probably love that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that it was part of my responsibility to get them to some things where they could interact with some people. I'm not saying all day long, but enough that they felt fulfilled in their life and their life circumstances. So occasionally that yeah. meant I had to rely on Voxer or you know, the telephone at night. <laughs> yeah, so I was homeschooled. Um, and Amy, you can tell us a little bit about your experience because you have more than I do. But I was homeschooled for kindergarten and then for 11th and 12th. And I was in public school in between that time. And one of the things that I remember telling my mom, there were a lot of benefits to being homeschooled, you know, for 11th and 12th grade. And I feel like the independent work prepared me well for college when you show up at class and they give you a syllabus and they say, you know, like you're going to be responsible for these things being turned in. Um, but one of the things that I did not like was that I felt like I had nothing to talk to my mom about because like, you know, when you go away to school and then you come home, you tell her all about your day and what you did, but she was there for my whole day, you know? So it's kind of like, oh, well, like there's nothing to tell you because, you know, you were here for the whole day. And so there wasn't anything happening that you didn't know about or weren't aware of. So, and that, you know, that was just a very little slice of, of homeschool experience with 11th and 12th grade. So Amy, when you were a homeschool student, what did you, how did that uh, work with being an extrovert? I, I'm assuming you think back on your childhood as an extroverted childhood as well? Oh yes, definitely. And my mom is an extrovert as well. So um, as far as like being an extrovert as a homeschooled student, um, it sort of varied from season to season because we moved a few times. Um, for most of my homeschool life, we had in real life people that we were meeting with very regularly for like projects and field trips and play dates and sleepovers and just all sorts of fun. So I definitely felt like my relationship tank there was full. And then when we moved actually in my high school, which, you know, is not ideal and that has nothing to do with like homeschool or not homeschool. Like that's just sort of an awkward time to move. But my right, parents, right, right. yeah, my parents really prioritized um, opportunities for me to both maintain older relationships I had, even though sometimes that like involved buying a plane ticket um, mm. or I was doing some online classes and they helped me travel to different places to have relationship time with those classmates that I had only met, you know, over the computer. Um, so that was really, was really great. Um, and I appreciate that very much, but I don't know, I ha had a different maybe experience as far as talking with my mom, but that may be because our family loved like debating theology and philosophy and history. And so we never really had a lack of things to talk about. We'd be like sitting there with our books at the dining room table, having deep conversations a lot. So maybe that's why I still like to do that. Uh, yeah. So do you have, you might've said this and I missed it. Are your, 
are your family members extroverts as well? Your your mom, dad, and brother? My mom is, my dad is not, and I think my brother would consider himself an extrovert as well. It's you know, it's different. He's a guy and I'm a girl, but um, yeah. 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 So we have I have two brothers who are most definitely extroverts. The third probably is as well. But um, you know, in, in our family growing up at dinner time, you we basically just all talked over each other all the time, not like in a rude way. It was just kind of like everybody's just kind of throwing their words in all the time. And um, that was really overwhelming for Matt. He just felt like, you know, like, why why does everyone interrupt each other? Why doesn't anyone <laughs> let anyone else finish their sentence? But it was just, you know, it wasn't like, n- none of us felt like um, uncared for by it. It was just sort of the style we were used to, but it was very different from what he was used to for interaction. If I can so, say one several, more thing about that really fast. This actually happened tonight at our dinner table. So a benefit of being an extrovert mom is like, I have a pretty high tolerance for like a lot of people talking and like throwing around their ideas and maybe getting into it verbally out loud, maybe even a little loud. Um, And like, I'm great with that. I'm like, yeah, this is great. I'm energized. But being married to an introvert, you know, he comes home, long day, you're sitting at the table and everyone's like, what I think we're having a great conversation and all the kids are like loud and into it. And he's like, please, everyone just stop talking. Like, <laughs> so, <laughs> it can be, it can be hard. It's a way, I guess, to show love to others too, to remember it's not just about like what makes us happy. Like got to show love to him too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's funny. Cause actually in our home, it's the opposite. So, um, You know, he's an introvert, introvert. I'm an extrovert. But um, one of the things I mentioned in the letter that I sent this morning to my subscribers is someone said to me um, a while back, you know, oh, I don't think I could homeschool because I'm an introvert and I just don't like all the noise and chaos. And I was like thinking, yeah, that's not exactly what I think of when I think of like what makes me an extrovert. It's like I love noise and chaos. (laughs) Um, because I totally get sensory overloaded with that. So, um, you know, by the end of the day, when it's time to have family dinner, I sometimes really dread that because to me, it just, it feels like, like having a sunburn and asking all the kids to pile in bed with you. It's like, you know, just like I am already sensory overloaded and the idea of packing all of us into this small space where all their noise is going to be all in one area. And my husband, you know, he's been in a quiet cubicle all day long and he comes home and he's got lots of like funny stories that he heard on the radio or whatever, all this stuff to talk about. And I'm kind of like, Oh, could we please just like, could everyone just fill their mouths with food and we don't talk about anything. So I guess that's one of those things where, you know, there's not a one way um, extrovert experience or depends on what you do during the day or how the age of your children or I don't know what, but um, let's see. Uh, Gussie says she thinks she's probably the only introvert in her family. And let's see. Okay. So Rachel had a question and what I did was I popped that over into our ask a question box. So we'll get to that at the end, but there are a couple of mamas who are commenting about being in that stage where they have, um, a range of kids and maybe not not people driving yet. So lots of people experiencing that. Okay, so um, Amy touched on this a little bit, but that there are some advantages to being an extrovert mom in the homeschool, some ways in which that that's helpful. Um, so Amy was talking about, um, and I feel like I feel like the sensory overload is probably more not related to being an extrovert or not being an extrovert, but for me, it's more related to maybe like, energy level, time of the month. Um, I know, you know, for quite a number of years, I was struggling with depression while homeschooling. And that for me, um, I feel like, you know, it just kind of um, exacerbated any other struggles that I had going on. So um, that's not necessarily like a anecdotal quote for what all extroverts were like, but um, anyway. I was going to pop in with a positive. Yeah, yeah. One thing that at least for me, it has made it easier is um, reaching out to people and helping my kids develop social circles has been easy. I feel like Mm -hmm. I, my introverted friends have said like, Oh, I'm so glad you remember to call and like make plans. Like Um, they would be very content not to, even if they have extroverted kids. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that just comes naturally to me. And I just kind of transferred it 
to my children for them. Um, making those coffee dates when my daughter, you know, was 14, you know, before it kind of occurred to her being like, well, why don't I get in touch with some of your the moms and your friends and, you know, you all can hang out and chat or making plans to go to the movies or hosting a little group of kids at the house. Like that just comes very naturally to me. I don't even have to think about it. So I do think that is an advantage. Um, I also, and I will say, trying to remember the differences in people I tend to pick up the slack for friends of mine who are in introverted purposefully, like not in like a mean way, but like I know they need their time alone sometimes more than I do. So I will go ahead and be like, Hey, just drop the kids off over here. If you want to come early and chat, that would be great. I would love it. But if you just need to go sit with your coffee for an hour, like I'm good. And there are times that I need to say, I can't handle it right now. But mm. in general, I probably can more like 70% of the time. And uh, so I go ahead and just and do that. And I think that's one way we can work together in a community. And also it's just been a, a bonus for me, for the kids. Just it comes really natural to fill the calendar. That is a great point. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't considered our interactions with others who are, you know, differently wired in that way than we are. What about you, Amy? Any thoughts about, or I guess you already were talking about how you enjoy the rousing conversation and the good discussion. And yeah, I feel like the ways in which my extroversion is a benefit to me, um, probably I don't recognize as much as I recognize ways in which, you know, I have struggles because I feel like you can't really compare what your life would be like if you weren't the way you were with what it's like now, you know, so there probably are benefits that I'm experiencing that I don't necessarily even chalk up as benefits but that if somehow I could wake up tomorrow and experience my life differently to be like, oh yeah, that was easier as an expert. Yeah, right. I, so, I, asked, says, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say, I asked the kids and I was like, what's the best or worst part of me being an extrovert? And my 11 year old daughter said, well, I mean, I've never had an introvert for a mom, but <laughs> she said, I just love that you get so excited about stuff. And you know, at, I guess because of being an extrovert, like. I get excited and it's like externally being Outward, yeah, shown yeah, yeah. to them more easily. So that was an encouragement to me. Yeah, Amy said it would be nice to have kids to come over to play with her youngest. And Jenny says that that's, that's her overfill the calendar, but reach out to her introvert friends and they appreciate it. So, okay, so what are some things that you have found helpful just for you personally to kind of manage, you know, the life of homeschool mom who was also an extrovert and filling that, you know, personal interaction tank and that kind of thing. Mary. Hmm. Um, I think, and this has happened as my kids have gotten older is giving my permission, myself permission to leave them home alone and go do my mm -hmm. thing um, for myself knowing full well they might play Minecraft for two hours <laughs> and knowing that that's okay because I needed that. Um, if I need a lunch date or um, just coffee with somebody, that kind of thing, just knowing that that's okay occasionally. It doesn't always have to be like academic rigor going on at home for me to be able to go fill my tank somewhere. Um, and I think the other thing I've learned to do is fit things in, in the margins. Like I hate getting up early, but I will meet someone for breakfast, even at like 7 30 AM on Saturday. If I have not before seven <laughs> and I don't want to be up before seven. So I'm going to show up unshowered and in my sweats, <laughs> but you know, just finding ways to still make that happen, even at a sacrifice to my sleep. Um, and still let family time happen as well. So that's been really helpful. Yeah. And for each mom, those, you know, like how those priorities rank are going to change, you know, at different times. Like, you know, if you've got a nursing baby, then maybe like, you know, I love people time, but sleep yeah. is what, you know, like that has to outrank everything right now. So yeah. What about you, Amy? Um, I think there are a couple of things. I mean, right now, uh, being a part of some, like it's more of a support group. It's not like a co-op with classes, but we do a monthly moms meeting and we do field trips. And that was really what I 
longed for was some relationship time, like interaction time and prioritizing that even if it's not necessarily like the topic I most want to learn about that month or the field trip I'm just dying to go on, but understanding that sometimes just the value of, of the relationship is worth it. Um, another thing is prioritizing the relationship time even when I'm physically tired. It's like you were mm -hmm. saying with, you know, I still have like little people, you have little people. Um, sometimes that can be hard, but trying to remind myself that my emotional exhaustion will improve and sometimes it's worth it to be a little bit physically exhausted i mean like mm -hmm. even a road trip to see a friend or something when i'm tired um, is worth it and then the other thing that's i think this is just like introvert extrovert just sort of adult friendship can be tricky um, finding friends and having the time to like have deep friendships and kind of letting go of the whole like find your tribe Thing. I don't know, for a long time I was grumpy because I didn't have like here, right down the street from me, you know, a few people who were just like me and liked all the same things and we would just be this amazing little community on a cul-de-sac, you know, and <laughs> that's just not, maybe some people have that and that that's amazing. I'm really happy for you. Uh, but to be able to realize that there are people that I might not have necessarily first thought would be my friends who can turn out to be really important in my relationship and sort of stepping outside just looking in a certain type of person or a certain type of way to be friends with people has mm -hmm. has really been a blessing and has has been a rich just relational time yeah 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 so I, i'm going to step out on a limb here and say um you know i think social media can be really a blessing in this in this arena. So, you know, there are tons of conversations out there and good conversations to be had about the proper place of social media and maybe what the downsides could be and that kind of thing. And like what you see on social media isn't the full story or it's not like as deep of a relationship as you might, you know, have in person or something like that. And I think that's, those are relevant, you know, conversations to have, but I feel like, in our society where we kind of have this interesting dynamic of, of like the world has gotten smaller in terms of, you know, you can, you can just pick up your phone and, and vox somebody who lives on the other side of the country and they can vox right back. And it's, you know, that's kind of an, an odd, nice thing. Um, but on the other hand, you know, while, while the world has gotten smaller, it's also gotten kind of more, um, like isolated. So, you know, we're, we're mothering our young children, but we're not living with like, you know, our aunties and our grandmothers in the next, you know, neighbor, you know, uh, the next home over, you know, like, it's not like where we have this community where we all walk to each other's houses and we're all our children are in each other's yards all the time. And, you know, so I feel like social media doesn't replace you know, the most intimate knowing and interacting, but it kind of provides that, like what we might've had in a, um, like a meeting at the general store. Like it's the, it's the knowing that can happen in the sense of like, um, you know, just kind of what's going on with you. Oh, your kid had a bee sting and this was a helpful remedy and ground beef is on sale. And, you know, is your child going to be in little league this year? And, you know, just all of those things that, you know, they might not be like the the deepest, most intimate conversation, but they're the kind of the the material that relationships can be built upon. Just the, you know, just kind of awareness of what's going on in each other's lives. And, you know, maybe not Facebook public, like out on your timeline, but certainly through text or through, um, you know, private message or whatever, you have a great opportunity for more intimate conversations. And, um, so, you know, like during the time where um, things were much harder for me in terms of like emotional um, struggles, as a matter of fact, these two ladies who are on here with me tonight were some of my greatest encouragers and people who regularly checked in on me, even though I don't know that I saw them in person at all through, you know, that time. But, um, you know, it was just, it was a real blessing to know that somebody would check in on me and just unprompted be like, Hey, I was thinking about you. How's it going? What, you know, how are you doing? So, um, 
you know, again, I know there are things to be said for in-person interaction, and I do think that's good, but I really feel like um, given the the time in which we live and the, you know, cultural context, uh, there can be a lot of blessing to social media or digital, you know, contact with people. Yeah. Mary, you mentioned Boxer. I don't know, do you want to tell people about that? Because you guys kind of were the ones to tell me about Boxer. Yeah, I mean, Voxer, um, it's just like WhatsApp, which I think a lot of people are familiar with WhatsApp, um, but it's a voice recording and it's designed for voice. So it's not like using text and recording your voice. It's really designed for ease of use to, um, you speak like a walkie talkie. If the other person happens to be on the other end, they can actually hear you at the moment you're speaking like a walkie talkie. Um, but if they don't, then it records for them to listen to in their own time. And I know mm -hmm. a lot of us were saying at the beginning, um, a lot of you relate to exactly where I am, though I do not have one driving. But that period before that first one is driving and you have this widespread and you're busy and you're torn and you're going everywhere. Voxer really saved um, for me, like that ability to have some ongoing conversation with other adults and friends and um to feel fulfilled in that way because um one of my friends is a morning person so they're always recording and talking to me at like 6 a.m <laughs> and when i wake up at like eight you know i can listen and then record back and then maybe she won't get to it until sometime after lunch but we could have this ongoing conversation and it's i have had actually sometimes i have even deeper conversations on Voxer, and I mean with close friends, but because when we get together for coffee, you do a lot of the small talk catch up also. You know, like, oh, how's the kid? You know, and you're talking about stuff, but on Voxer, we can just really get to the point, like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. deep things. So I've, I've really loved that. I agree. And I feel like Voxer, so for me, in theory, the idea of a phone conversation is lovely, but you know how it is. Like, as soon as you shut the bathroom door or dial the phone, your children will, um, you know, go berserk and start climbing the walls and whatever. And it, it's almost like they know, like mommy's tied down and she can't do anything about this right now. Um, so to me, a phone call is really stressful because I can't really, like if I'm writing an email and somebody loses it, I can just like step away. It's no big deal. So for me, Voxer was great because, you know, it's real talking. So I'm, I'm hearing the person's, you know, tone of voice and expression and all that, just like you would in a phone call, but you could do it in little tiny bits. And you know, like Mary said, you don't, it doesn't need to be, you don't need to both be available at the same time, you know? And so I can't tell you how many Voxer messages I've left where it's like, okay, I'm talking about something. And then like, uh, hold on. And then the thing ends. And then like, it's, you know, 45 minutes later before I say like, okay, so my three-year-old was, <laughs> and now we can get back to whatever we were saying, but it's not stressful. Like, okay, now this person is just sitting on the other end of the phone waiting for me to get back or I have to hang up on them or something. So that, yeah. yeah. And Rachel mentioned Marco Polo. I was going to bring up that app too. I have a few friends that we do that. It's it's similar to Voxer, only it's actually video. So you record a video of yourself. And if someone's on the app at the time, they can watch it live and interact right back with you. In fact, I did that with a friend last night. Um, or they can watch it later on their own time and reply to you. So that's been a really fun, fun way to keep up with some of my out-of-town family. And well, not family, okay. friends. I don't know why I said now family. I, like family. I, thought, I thought Rachel was making a joke. See, this is how like out of the loop <laughs> I love technology. It's like, oh, Marco Polo, that's funny. <laughs> I could do a video. I was <laughs> <laughs> lost for way too much from like in bed first thing in the morning. So there was not be yeah, Marco yeah. Polo video going on. <laughs> yeah, there are times yeah, no, where I like, oh, Marco Polo. Sorry. Yeah. So another thing I love about Voxer is that, um, so, you know, a lot of times I'm, so I'm definitely like a night owl and not a morning person. So a lot of times I'm in bed at night and my husband is already asleep next to me. And so I've got in my earbuds and I'm listening to like a Voxer message someone has left me, but then I'm typing a response because I can't, I have to hop up and run into the bathroom and shut the door. <laughs> to a response. Voxer message. So, yes, and I'm sure that being an extrovert um, contributes to my not wanting to go to bed at night because it's like, oh, you know, the children are finally asleep and, you know, now is the time where I could like hop on Facebook or I could, you know, get on Voxer or I could catch up with that email or whatever because it's like, you know, that's the one thing that 
you know, was missing from my day was that people connection. So, okay, well, um, we do have a couple of questions that folks have asked in the chat box and I just went ahead and added them to the ask a question window. So we're gonna get into that in just a second. Um, before we do that, I just wanna let you know that we have um, several um, discussions coming up this month that you might be interested in. Next week, I'm gonna be talking with Ann Carrico about homeschooling high school. The week after that, I'm gonna be on here by myself and I'm gonna share a little bit about homeschooling through depression. So I talked a little bit about that earlier, but if that's something that you've experienced or that you'd like to think or hear more about, then I would welcome you to come and listen to that. And then three weeks from tonight, I get to interview Julie Bogart about her brand new book, which was actually released today, The Brave Learner. So I'm really thrilled to get to do that. So if any of those sound interesting to you, or if you would just like to come on here again another time and hear more, just hover over my name up at the top there where it says Lynna at Live Without Training Wheels and click on follow. And then, oh, Amy just got her book in today. Um, and then you'll be notified when I go live. Or you can um, click over to my account and, and uh, register for those events specifically if any of them sounded interesting to you. I'm also going to pop up a little button here at the bottom because um, Amy, as we mentioned earlier, wrote a really fun post about three myths about homeschool moms and, or excuse me, about extrovert homeschool moms. And um, so if you're interested in that, you can follow that link over there to read her post now or at some point in the future. All right, so ladies, here's our first question. Rachel says, what do you do when you have both intensely extroverted and introverted children? I tend to meet the needs of my extroverted children really well because I get it. However, I have a child that will ask to go home the second we get into the car for any event or obligation. Any thoughts about that one? Amy, you have, do you have a mix of introverted and extroverted children? I do. Um, I guess it somewhat depends on the age of the child, but I definitely have kids who really get peopled out um, or can recognize when they're starting to feel like a little bit of that stress and just know that they need to be by themselves. So sometimes that means they still come with us and have to be polite, but they don't have to have like lengthy conversations or necessarily play. Um, other times, like when they're old enough, I'm okay with leaving them home while I take other people somewhere. That's okay. Um, other times, if they want to bring a book, and again, this all like depends on the situation. Like it's going to vary, but there have been times when I've said, okay, bring your book, bring the game. You can sit and play um, you know, with by yourself. Um, I also find that sometimes depending on the child and depending on why they don't want to be with people, um, if it's an event where there can be like some sort of activity, like playing on a playground or um, like a more active kind of interaction where you're not having to like sit and talk to people, <laughs> Um, they're much more likely to go along with that and kind of run around. Because then on, on a playground, like you can be by yourself, but you don't look rude. Very true. Yeah. So my my oldest is also, um, I you know, I have a feeling that I might have other children who are introverted, but I'm not sure that they're self-aware enough to say like, you know, I'd really like to be alone or I really don't want to be around people that much. So I have one, you know, my oldest is introverted and um, very much like his daddy and recognizes like, you know, things that his daddy says he like really resonate with him. So he's caught on to like, oh, yes, I'm wired like daddy. I have those same thoughts. And then um, and then my next three are all girls and all very extroverted. So, um, you know, and I'm not sure what that would look like if it was a younger one, you know, who wanted to be more alone or have more alone time. But for him, he will often just take, um, he's, he's always drawing. So he will often just take his sketch pad and pencil along. And, um, you know, if it's a, like you said, kind of depends on the gathering. But if it's a place where um, it would be fine for him to just find a quiet, quiet corner and do that, he will. Um, and he also, like my husband, doesn't necessarily mind conversation if it's, you know, like if he could be sitting in a corner talking to one person, um, you know, as opposed to like engaged in this, you know, big group, loud, you know, um, conversation or something like that. So, um, and I feel like, especially for us, one of the things that's been really important and helpful is just open conversation about it, you know? Mm -hmm. So instead of like, 
no, that's rude. You have to be with people or, you know, just like, okay, well, tell me more about that. Well, let's explore what we could do and what would this make you feel better? Or what if you knew that this was going to be the setup or that you'd have an opportunity to do this or that and just, um, you know, keeping, you know, like an open dialogue about it so that they know that you're aware and that you're willing to talk with them about it and, you know, that they don't have to feel ashamed that they like more people time or less people time or and making sure they have some sort of like emergency escape <laughs> like mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. if we're in a situation and you're starting to feel like you know you're going to blow up or something like because different kids respond to that in different ways like mm -hmm. you need to go like calm down just come and tell me and i won't be upset like if you come and tell me like can i go into the room by myself you know, or like a, you know, a safe place, but like if there's a place where they can just go be by themselves, just come and tell me, like kind of pre-handle pre it before the crisis happens. Because mm -hmm. then if you have a kid who then freaks out, then you're dealing with like a whole nother set of issues. So. True, yeah, yep, very true. Very yeah, true, I'm and a good place in... to have, just to be able to predict what's gonna be difficult for you and to recognize when you're starting to get in a place where that's challenging. And I know I don't have any introverted kids, <laughs> but myths about extroverts. I do have kids who need alone time at times and will say. And so I think that um, putting it out there in conversation, I have one child and somebody suggested this. And again, this depends on where you live, but we live on this circle that you can walk. It's about a half a mile circle of houses. And he will leave three, four times a day and just go walk the circle by himself. Sometimes it's because he needs a break from school. <laughs> sometimes he needs a break from me. Um, <laughs> sometimes he just needs to process his thoughts. He also is just, I don't know if it's his extra version or what, he just has constant thoughts in his head that he wants to go think about, which sounds introverted though, but um, he, he goes and walks. So if you can let that child have scheduled breaks during the day, you know, to fill up their need for quiet space, um, I think that really helps too. And then, yeah. yeah, if they're old enough to stay home alone, we've done that too. And Jenny says, yes, I have a child with sensory issues and he needs to know he will have a space and time to take a break. I will take him outside or let him sit with me or go to a quiet room as needed. All good stuff. I think just communication, wisdom, yep, all general <laughs> challenging but important parts of parenting. All right, Karen says, have any of you gone through a period of social anxiety where you have spent your whole life extroverted but suddenly feel introverted and don't know how to handle that? And it seems most of my friends are introverted and I need to find some extroverted ones. My kids are older and my husband travels every week, so I long for other moms to talk to and hang out with. I was going to say, um, I don't know about a period of social anxiety, but I definitely have had times probably even a few months like it wasn't just like oh this is a, a week i need a break from everyone but just a few months where i was just overwhelmed with my own life that yeah i didn't really I, it's like i wanted to go into the calendar and cancel everything and just sit in a hole and eat chocolate or something <laughs> i mean forever so yeah. um yeah, it was hard to kind of figure out like, what's wrong with me? Am I depressed? Am I this? And I was just busy um, for me. So that kind of was just recognizing like, you know what, what is the thing I need during this season with how I'm feeling to take care of me? And um, that's what I did. I actually, I think I went out to coffee alone a few times um, with a book and just, just relaxed into that season. And then it changed again. <laughs> So. Yeah, for me, you know, the, definitely, um, I think one of the challenges of struggling with depression was feeling like not myself, feeling like, you know, I just didn't have that, um, you know, I don't know, I just had always thought of myself as an extrovert. And I don't know that I became like not an extrovert while I was struggling with depression, but it definitely changed my um, my capacity for interaction, my desire to go out. Usually, if I made myself go out and do something, I came home saying, I'm so glad I did that. It wasn't like I went out and then I came home going, 
oh, that was awful. I wish I hadn't spent my evening that way. It was harder to get out to do things. And I did less of it, which was probably important for me too. But um, one thing that I read, and I, you know, I'm not a doctor, I, I'm not making any broad statements about depression or anything like that. But um, so, you know, right after you have a baby, and especially if you're nursing, your estrogen is suppressed. And estrogen is often, I, you know, I don't know that this rel relates to being introvert or extrovert or whatever, but estrogen is the hormone that often makes you more outgoing, more confident, more, you know, um, looking for interaction. And um, that your body naturally, like right after you've had a baby, your body is kind of naturally saying, you know, stay home, circle the wagons, get rest, nurse that little baby, you know, just kind of do, do the home front kind of thing for a little while. And so for me, I'm not, again, not making any broad statements, but for me, I just felt like um, it was like that kind of feeling that, you know, maybe mom's experience for two weeks or six weeks or something just went on and on and on and on. And so instead of it being like, oh, the two weeks after the baby's born or the six weeks until your, you know, postpartum checkup or whatever, it was like 18 months, you know, which after a while you're like, where's me? <laughs> I don't. I miss me. Where did I go? So, um, yeah. So I don't know if I would say, well, it might have been some social anxiety. But I think for me, the social anxiety stemmed more from the fact that not everybody around me knew what was going on. I mean, I did share with, you know, certain people who I knew and loved and could trust with some of that. But um, it's just, you know, and it's something that's, and, and this isn't true for only depression, but for um, any kind of struggle, like if you have a teen who's going through something rough, that's really not public, you know, to everybody or anything like that, where like the thing that's kind of constantly buzzing on your brain, isn't something that you're just necessarily going to talk to anyone you run into about it can, it can create a sense of like, I'm here, but I feel sort of alone, even in public. So if that's, mm -hmm. If that's social anxiety, then I think, you know, different life experiences can create that kind of feeling of like, I'm here, but I feel like I'm not really connected because there's this thing that I can't talk about that's um, not that you could never talk about it with anybody, but, you know, just wouldn't be the thing that you might just share in a group of half a dozen ladies going out for coffee or something. Yeah. So. I was just going to say that in times when, I've like seen one of my best friends is calling me or sent me a text and I just like get this pit in my stomach. Like I don't even want to talk to that person. Knowing that I am an extrovert, that's always actually been a warning sign. Like, hey, stop. Let's see what else is going on. Sometimes it's like Mary say, like there's just a season you're really busy and maybe this is sort of like your body's way of telling you like, slow down, give yourself some space nurture yourself in whatever way, you know, whatever is missing there. Sometimes it's been like a postpartum depression thing or like other hormonal issues going on. Like that can actually be a, a good, not like warning sign of something terrible or anything like that, but like, okay, this is interesting. This isn't how I've always been. So what else is going on? Is there something else to, to deal with a relationship, other situations? So. Yep. Yes. So wise. So um, let's see. Karen says that she's 52 and in menopause, no estrogen at all, just on the other end of it. I, I have no idea if this is typical of all women, but my mom has said that she felt like after menopause, just hormonally, she was so much more level. And she is um, she's a professional counselor. And so she said that she often, you know, when she's talking with younger women who are still going through you know, like still in the cycling phase of their life that she just feels great sympathy, remembering how challenging that was to just constantly be you know, up and down and up and down. So I'm really holding out hope that there's more stability in my future because it certainly was that way for her. Um, so Rachel says she's, she's um, still in the nursing phase of life. Okay. So Amy, who has just joined us is actually, I'm going to give her credit because way back when I think Mary was coming on to talk about big conversations and I emailed my followers about that. She was the one who wrote back and said, 
can y'all talk about being an extroverted homeschool mom? So this this whole thing was kind of Amy's idea. So um, she said she almost missed this because she just got home going out for tea with other extroverted homeschool moms <laughs> and she'll have to ca catch the replay. So anyway, thank you, Amy. I'm glad that you were able to join us and had such a great idea for this discussion. So yeah, I think there was actually more to that question too. Oh, oh I missed it just went away. That's okay. It's still here. But it had to, yeah. And it was actually Karen who asked it. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was interesting. You said the estrogen thing. And then she mentioned being in menopause because mm -hmm. maybe that was some of the social anxiety. I mean, when your body was changing and, and levels are all over, that could have hap happened. But she also mentioned just wanting to find more extroverted friends. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So I'm wondering if we had thoughts or suggestions. Yeah, it just says it seems like mo most of my friends are introvert, introverted, and I need to find some extroverted ones. And then also that her kids are older and her husband is traveling a lot. I was going to say I find with my introverted friends, <laughs> I can rotate. <laughs> like I could go out every Thursday night. Yeah, but maybe they don't. <laughs> so I can pick a different one. <laughs> so I'm not going to get everyone together. It's not going to be like a gang kind of thing. But, you know, I can take one of them out one Thursday night, another one out another Thursday night. And then I'm having interaction. But um, they're going out once a month. <laughs> and I think Karen mentioned she had older kids, too. So I'm wondering if if there might be some like you had said earlier, like going out where the, the teens were having coffee and the moms could have coffee too. Maybe looking for some ways to combine older kid and mom stuff. Where are the extroverted moms? <laughs> They're all here in this crowdcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is anyone here to live with your Karen? <laughs> <sighs> I'm Raleigh. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, um, I've always thought that um, adult friendships would be like where you and your husband have this couple who like you're best friends with the wife and your husband is best friends with the husband and you just are <laughs> a couple besties and you constantly do things together and you have these great conversations and, um, you know, and that, I don't know, that has never like happened for us partly, I think, because, you know, my husband is an introvert and He's like, well, I have you. You're my friend. So, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, you know, I feel like I, I'm, I'm thinking about what Amy said earlier about just kind of like, you know, it might not have materialized the way you imagined, but that doesn't mean that you don't have, you know, people that you can be encouraged by or interact with or be. Um, and you may not have that one friend who like, likes the same books and the same movies and that likes the music you like and also likes coffee and also, you know, shares your political views and also like all those things, you may end up having to divide that up. Like, well, this is the friend that I know is going to go and watch the crazy movie with me and not mind that I'm talking the whole time because I'm like having an interaction with the film, you know, and this person is the person I know I can call if I want to have this like intense theological conversation. Um, so I guess also just sort of letting go of that ideal of finding the perfect friend, which I still, you know, that would be nice. Yeah. I don't really want to be anybody else's perfect friend. I think that might be too much pressure. <laughs> I'd be glad to be one of a number of people that they, you know, would like to interact with, but I don't want to be anybody's like my, the one perfect <laughs> friend. All right, so Jimmy says, I find a lot of extroverts are super busy. If they don't pr prioritize friendship, they aren't available to get together. I am friends with lots of introverts. That's an interesting observation. Karen says, my husband has to take, um, has to talk all day long for his job. When he flies home, he has no more words left. I have a week's worth. <laughs> yeah. Relatable. Yeah. Gonna, Relatable here. For Karen, um, when I moved from Maryland to North Carolina, I had to go through the whole process of making new friends. Um, as an adult and new friends for all my kids. And one thing that was helpful if you're looking for other extroverted moms, maybe even other homeschool moms, um, one I was gonna suggest, just look at what's offered in your area, like go to a library book club meeting, go to something that you're interested in that other adults are doing. Um, your kids were older, your youngest looked like they were 12. So they, I don't know if you leave them home alone. We did at 12. I know there are like maybe five states that actually have a law that it's 13, but um, 
you know, look up things that adults are doing socially in the area and see if you maybe click with someone at that library book club. I mean, go to five library book clubs and see if you find one with a person you like. I also joined a ton of Facebook groups for my county in my area, um, you know, homeschool groups, social groups, you know, the neighborhood groups that were on Facebook. And you could throw out there like, hey, you know, I'd love to have coffee with some homeschool moms on Friday afternoon. Anybody up for it? And just through things like that, um, see if you connect with somebody and maybe there'll be another um, extrovert. So it, I will say that that time period of my life was socially exhausting. And I do not get socially exhausted easily. I think it was between trying to find my friends and friends for four children I, I remember just looking at my daughter one time when she wanted me to go walk over and introduce myself to yet more strangers to try to meet them. And I was like, really? I just, I just don't want to today. <laughs> like I'm just so done, but it was really worth it. The gym, Amy just said the gym. Um, I just joined the Y and they get these challenge groups. And so I feel like there are adults out there that you can kind of pop into something going on and see maybe if there's someone you could connect with. But I will admit it's exhausting during that time period. Yeah, yeah. So, Mary, I wasn't laughing at you. I just happened to notice while you were talking that Amy said, I've considered standing at a store and pretending <laughs> to be a greeter. <laughs> That's awesome. Put on a Santa suit, ring a bell. <laughs> you know, I know Sarah McKenzie talked about, uh, from Read Aloud Revival, she talked about one time when she had younger kids, she volunteered at her library, or maybe she's was a paid position but she would rotate different libraries and she was like it was awesome because there were all these people coming in and they wanted books and i got to talk about books and talk to all the people so you never know what kind of like, yeah. out of the box ideas there could be yes i worked at a library before i taught elementary school like when i was in college i worked at a library and i loved that job it was so fun <laughs> Karen, Amy, <laughs> Karen says she'll stand with you at the store and greet people. Well, if you're both there, go have coffee. <laughs> you don't have to stand and greet other people. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Amy, um, I think you missed it earlier, but um, Amy Sloan said, and this is my favorite quote ever, is um, you have to correct me if I misquote you, Amy, but something about the homeschool mom is a unique position because you can be so lonely, but also completely peopled out at the same time, which I love. That's that's kind of like my new motto of what it is to be a homeschool extroverted mom. So yes, yes, it is. Okay. Well, this has been fabulous. I'm so shocked that we talked about extroversion for an hour. How could that have happened? <laughs> It has been a great conversation tonight, and I'm so thankful that, um, of course, it's lovely to have Amy and Mary on here live with me, um, but it's also been fabulous to have all of you who've been commenting. It is so much more fun when there are people um, interacting and commenting and asking questions, so thank you to those of you all who made this evening really, um, yeah, it's so shocking, Mary says, um, made this evening really interactive and and a joyful place to be. So thank you all for that. I'm going to go ahead and sign off. But um, again, I'll be back next week talking with Ann Carico about homeschooling high school. So look forward to seeing some of you there. Thank you, Amy and Mary, for being with me this evening. Thanks, Bye. Linda. Bye. Bye.